mind of a story of a man who came to watch a little league game and there one boy sit on the bench and, and the man looks at the scoreboard and sees that it's 18 to nothing for the other team. And this man sees a boy sitting on the bench and says to him, oh man, you must be really discouraged because of the score. And the little boy says, why should I be so down or feel so down about this game? It's, it's only the first inning and we haven't, not, we haven't even gone up to bat yet. <laughs> it's a little boy with hope. And that's a good thing, right? Hope is a good thing. Hope can mean two things. It can be meaning something that we desire to have happen, or it can mean something that we recognize has happened. It's something that's been fulfilled for us. And, and the latter is the kind of hope that we have as Christians because we have hope that we'll be in heaven someday. It's not a desire that we... We, we, we would desire to be there someday, and, and it's not the kind of, will it happen or will it not happen? No, it, it will happen because of Christ and his gift of salvation, and because we have received that gift of salvation. But the former hope is the desire of, of is this going to happen or not? And, and, but we want it to happen. So Bella has these certain ideas of gifts she would like to have happen, she'd like to get, hopefully, uh, Ted mentioned he, his hope of wanting to see his COVID virus gone. Stella sharing about her hope to be able to visit with family during Christmas. These are all things that we desire to happen, and, and they may or may not happen, but we hope that they happen, right? Because these are good things. Hope is an important thing. And, and I'm thankful that actually Ted brought up hope that this whole COVID thing is gone by Christmas. Because it's one of those things that sometimes we ask, when we see big things in the world that happens, we're like, where's the hope? And what hope can we have? So what hope can we have this morning as we look at God's word? We will see that this morning. Like this little boy who had hope that they could still win even though they're down 18 nothing. Um, we can still have hope of something wonderful to take place still in these times. In our passage, two passages this morning, these are the only two places we find this name of God, Bekwe Israel. The Lord is hope. Or sorry, the hope of Israel. God is the hope of Israel. He is the hope for all of us. And it's important for us to understand this name of God. So then again, we see his character. So we can know him better. So we can love him better. So we can serve him better. First point I want to share with you on this this morning is this. That hope, the hope of Israel is our Savior. The hope of Israel is our Savior. Back in Jeremiah 14, verse 8, it says this. O you hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be a stranger in the land like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? There's some important things here in this verse that we can pull out. It's, it's a cry out to God Recognizing that God is the hope of Israel. Now, the book of Jeremiah is written by the prophet Jeremiah. And some of it is some of the, the things that God told Jeremiah to tell Israel, but also some things that God wanted to, Jeremiah to understand too. And in this passage here, it's the time again when Israel is in exile. Why is Israel in exile? Because they walked away from God. There's a time that he decided, we see throughout the Old Testament actually several times that Israel is called by God and then they end up walking away from God. And because God loves Israel, he puts them in exile so they face hardship, so they recognize their need for God. So then God can rescue them again as they turn back to him. And here it's, it's one of those things that God's saying to Jeremiah to say to Israel, that God is their hope. And again, it's Savior in a time 
of tribal of trouble. We just sung about that this morning, didn't we, when we sang Faithful One. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. For Israel, God is the hope of Israel. And he is the hope for us too. Just as God is the Savior of Israel, God is the Savior for us, for the whole world. It's interesting these words though too I want to point out. The question is asked, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? That is a significant question. And there's actually debate about that question. Is this question a question of, of Israel to God? Or is this actually a question of, of God to Israel? A couple sources I looked at had mentioned that they say that is actually the people crying out to God not to be a stranger to them because when well, they're, they're in exile, this troublesome time. So it seems like God feels far away from them. That could be one possibility. And, and kind of speaks to us today too, doesn't it? That sometimes when we face trials and tribulations, sometimes we feel like, Lord, where are you? You feel quiet. You feel distant to me right now. But the truth is, God isn't distant. We may feel that way, but he's right there with us still. I, I actually believe that this is actually a cry out of God to Israel instead. Because again, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? I think it's the, God's cry out to Israel. Because Israel was the nation that turned away from God. That's why they're in, in exile in the first place. So God was like a stranger to Israel because they walked away from him. That kind of speaks to us in a way too, doesn't it? There's sometimes, some people have what's called the dark night of the soul where sometimes they question the relationship with God. Are they even saved? Or, or does God even exist? And maybe because of people walking away from, maybe we've walked away from God a bit, maybe. Are there stories of people who were Christians who walked away from the faith? Um, some of you have heard the story um, at one prayer meeting not long ago. Sure, and I were on a drive back home from getting groceries, and we were listening to one to the Christian radio station, and this one band came up, and we are listening to them, and I said to Sherry that I had just heard the news a couple of weeks ago that the lead singer of this band had become an atheist. He walked away from the faith. And I said to Sherry, I said, I wonder, I wonder what happened with his time with God. I wonder if he stopped reading his Bible and stopped praying. Because it's, it's like a song from um, Casting Crowns called Slow Fade. Um, our relationship with God, if, we, if people walk away from God, it's a slow fade because not spending time with God. And actually, the song I mentioned, Slow Fate, has to do with actually a marriage breaking apart because the couple not spending time together and the husband making bad and wrong choices. It's like that relationship with God. If we don't spend time with him, then our relationship with him starts to fade away. So how does this relate to, faith, to hope again? To the hope of Israel, to the hope of the world? is to continue to seek after him. Not to be like the Israelites who would walk away from God from time to time and again have to end up in exile, but to be faithful to him because he has been faithful to us. Because only in him do we find hope. So again, I think this has more to do with God crying out to Israel saying, I'm like a stranger to you. Turn back to me. And I'll draw you close. I'll save you. I'm your savior. I'll save you from those who have brought you into exile. Even though I allowed them to bring you into exile. But it's because I want to draw you back to me. 
God is the hope of Israel. He is the hope for us. He is our Savior. It's interesting, researchers had done a study several years ago to try to figure out some things about hope. I don't know why they used rats, but I think that this test would be done better with people instead of rats. But anyway, they did this test with rats and they had two groups of rats, one group of rats that were all on their own. They're actually in, a, in, a, in tubs of water. They couldn't get them themselves at all either too. So they had one in one tub, one group of rats and one group of rats in another tub. In the first tub, they just let the rats be in the tub. No, again, no way out for them. The second group of rats, once in a while, they would grab one of the rats out of the, the tub. A little while later, bring the rat back. And over time, they started to see that the first tank, the first tub of rats, they all end up dying in the tub. But the second tank, there was a flurry of activity. They came to the conclusion was that the second tank, that when they saw that one rat was pulled out of the, out of the tub, that all of a sudden there became hope for the rest of the rats to be saved. It's like that with us in a way. But we have actual hope because God is our Savior. This isn't hope deferred. This isn't the kind of hope that is going to be fulfilled and so our heart's going to be faint. It's hope that's realized for us. Jesus is our Savior. Here's what the hope of Israel saves us from. It saves us, first of all, from our sin. I know we know this well, but it's a remi good reminder for us, though, still, that we have hope, hope that is realized because Jesus is our Savior who has saved us from our sin. Romans 6, verse 7 to 11 says this, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now you have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Sounds like hope, doesn't it? We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all. Not for some, for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are saved from our sins. We have the hope to be saved from our sins. And not just hope that we desire that maybe someday it will happen, but that it has happened. Jesus saves us from our sin. Did that at the cross for us. The thing that we do every Sunday, the communion table we celebrate together, Reminder of what Christ has done reminds us of the hope that we have that Jesus has saved us from our sins. Also, the hope of Israel saves us from death. It's not just from our sins, but the consequence of our sins, and that is being death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56 to 57. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This death in this passage isn't speaking of death as in being buried into the grave because our life has ended. It's talking about death as in an eternity in hell. That term death, it's important to understand what it means because it can mean those two things. It can mean being buried, life has ended, but it also can mean an eternity in hell. And that's what Paul means here when he writes these words in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But praise be to God that he has saved us from sin and its consequences of death and eternity in hell. So the hope of Israel is our Savior. Second thing we learn, which is in our other, next passage this morning, is the hope of Israel is our fountain of of living water. 
Turn me now. Turn with me now to Jeremiah seventeen verse thirteen. Seventeen verse thirteen. And again, here's what this verse says. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who run away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. In Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah is writing to Israel what God had given him to tell to Israel and it's because Israel was f- focusing on material things and running after those things instead of trusting in God. Hmm. Things haven't changed much, has it? <laughs> we, we live in a day and age where the majority of our world chases after material things still and doesn't chase the things of God instead. Now, we're not saying it's bad to have material things. No, we need material, some material things. Like we need clothes, obviously, right? We need home, we need, we need food, uh, and it's okay to have things that entertain us. But it's the pursuit of those things above God that isn't good. Because those things don't bring life, do they? And that's the point of this verse. Pointing out that God is the hope of Israel yet again, not those material things. It also mentions about they they would be put to shame, that they would be written in the earth. Who? What does that mean? Well, it relates to what we just talked about a moment ago too. Written in the earth, death, but that death having to do with an eternity in hell, because material material things don't lead us to God; they actually lead us away from God most of the time, don't they? Now, again, we're not saying that material things are evil. Um, There's a lot of material things that are good, but is our focus on those things or are they on God? I admit at times in my own life, there's been times been more concerned about material things than the things of God, particularly when sometimes when I look at the bank account and I kind of wonder, Lord, (laughs) um, things are a little tight, but yet... My hope isn't in those material things. My hope is in the Lord. And when the focus is on the Lord, those things seem to be not as important. What's the, that hymn? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. How does that go? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. What's that line again? And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. It speaks of hope again, doesn't it? The hope that is in God, not in material things. Even as we think of this whole virus thing going on, our hope really isn't in the medical field, although we're thankful for our doctors and nurses, but our hope is in God. And the things of earth will strangely dim. Now, as I say, that doesn't mean that we would be reckless about things. But we don't need to worry about these things, these troubles of our world, um, troubles we see in politics, politi- the troubles we see around the world with wars and rumors of wars. Things of earth will go strangely dim. Our eyes must be focused on God because he is our hope. It's kind of like a man who's walking in the desert, who's been walking for hours and hours and hours, and then all of a sudden sees an oasis in the distance. What happens to that man? 
He has hope all of a sudden, doesn't he? Because he knows that that oasis, seeing those palm trees, that there's got to be water there. So there's relief in sight. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there's relief in sight. Because Jesus is that living fountain for us. The hope of Israel, your living fountain, your living fountain of water offers you two things. He offers us, first of all, exactly that living water. John 4 verse 10 says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This verse comes into the story of the Samaritan woman. Remember that story? Jesus is just sitting outside of Samaria and sends his disciples into town to get some, some supplies. And as he's sitting by this well, this woman comes on her own to fill her water jugs up. Because, see, she was a woman who was thought by her society of someone of little repute. She was a woman who actually had, had had several husbands and even the one, as we know from the story, that she was living with then was not her husband. And Jesus had mentioned that to her. But Jesus mentioned in this conversation too that he first of all asked her for water and she says, well, how could you have a drink of water? The wall's deep. And he tells her, but if you would have, if you would have known that with I asking you for living water, if you know who I was, or who I am, you would have asked me for living water. Now, what is this living water? It's hope, but it's it's the hope of eternal life. A hope again for us as Christians that is fulfilled. Not a hope that we're waiting to happen, but a hope that is fulfilled. So we must turn to Jesus, because He is our living fountain, He is our living water. That's why we spend time in his word each day, time in prayer each day, so we can be refreshed from the living water that he gives us, so we can grow in him. The thing about water is it causes things to grow, doesn't it? Now, we're in that season of winter where plants aren't growing outside anymore, but a day is coming when that snow will melt and we'll start to see new life again. The water from the snow will melt, it's a little fresh in the earth, We'll see some rains, and as we plant our gardens or plant flowers, as we look at our lawns, we'll see things start to grow because water causes things to grow. Jesus is that living fountain for us that when we spend time with him, we'll grow in faith and love for him and we'll grow in, in our depth and understanding and love for him. Also, the hope of Israel, your fountain of living water, offers you eternal life. Romans 6, verse 22 and 23. We know the words of 23 very well, don't we? But we sometimes forget about the verse before it. Verse 22 starts with, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Then verse 23 again, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I need to start remembering when I share the gospel to include verse 22 because it's a reminder of the hope of eternal life. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're free from sin. Now we're slaves of God, but we're slaves with the benefit of relationship with God. In fact, we're more than slaves. Paul says elsewhere that we're children of God. Heirs of his kingdom because of his gift of eternal life. We see that the hope of Israel is more than just the hope of Israel. He is the hope of the whole world because he is living water for us so we can grow spiritually, but also because he offers eternal life. God is a good God. 
He is the one who gives us hope. So no matter what we're facing, whatever we're fearful or anxious about, we can have true peace because of the hope we have in him. Yes, it's important for us to understand God's names, the many names he has, because again, it reveals his character to us. And today his name reveals to us hope, that God is the God of hope for all of us, for eternity, and even in this time now. Especially in this time now. I don't know about you, but I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, I don't want to listen to the media anymore. It's so negative. <laughs> if it's not stuff about COVID and whether you should or shouldn't wear masks, whether you should be hiding in a bunker or not, or whether it's about the U.S. election, or whether it's about our own politics in our own country, or whether it be about some asteroid out in space that could hit our planet in 2068. <laughs> we don't have to worry about these things because we have hope. Hope in the hope of Israel. The hope not just for Israel, but the hope for the whole world. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is our hope. I want to call us to two points of action this morning. The first is this. Know that hope is fulfilled in Jesus. That's where your true hope is. As I have thought about the politics in our country in the last six months to a year, actually even through the last two elections, seeing the Bible our political landscape, I started to lose a little bit of hope for our country. But then God spoke to me and reminded me, don't put your hope in the politicians. I am your hope. So know that hope is fulfilled in Jesus. Your hope isn't fulfilled in our politicians. Your hope isn't filled in from me. <laughs> your hope isn't found in your spouse or your children or your parents or your friends. As important as those relationships are. But your hope is in Jesus. So know that your hope is in Jesus. Second point of action is this. Turn to Jesus who can give you hope. So when you're in those anxious times and worrisome times, turn to him and trust him. Turn to him and say, Lord God, I give my anxieties to you. I surrender those to you. Because I know in you, I can have peace because of the hope that is in you. Here's a challenge for you. What is that you feel anxious about right now? Whatever that is, give that concern to him. But there's the encouragement for you the two. Jesus is hope fulfilled. Not hope of something that we desire to happen, but he is hope fulfilled. God can replace your despair with hopefulness. Do you want hope that isn't based on what you desire to wish to happen, but is based on hope that is fulfilled, reality? Then turn to Jesus, the one who gives hope, hope that is guaranteed. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are Mekwe Israel, the hope of Israel. And we're thankful, Lord, that, that you're that you are the hope not only of Israel, but you are the hope of the whole world. And that in you we find hope. And because of that hope in you, we have peace. Lord, forgive us in the times when we despair, when we're anxious. 
Lord, remind us to bring those and give those to you because you care for us. You want us to rest in your peace and to remember the hope that we have that is in you. Lord, we're so thankful, though, too, that you are always faithful. That when we, even though when we doubt sometimes, and Lord, we know that doubt isn't always necessarily a bad thing as long as we turn that back to you to come back to you. Lord, may our doubt never walk, cause us to turn away from you, but may it cause us to look upon you again because you are hope. So, Lord, in those times when we are anxious, forgive us, and may we turn those things to you to trust you more. Lord, when we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, because the light is so far down the tunnel, may we still trust you. When we're concerned about those financial things or relationships or or COVID, or or a country, or this world. May we trust you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are hope. Lord, we thank you that you never fail us. You are a good God. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the will of the Father. Amen.